Okay. I'll open it up for because yeah, you don't need more content. I can tell. Um, <laughs> you guys are going really? You, it's that obvious? Yeah, it's that obvious. Um, you're doing great. By the way, there's a lot of content. I understand that. So we got a few minutes. If, if there's time, if you want to, I'll do some Q and A. If not, I'll pray for you and dismiss the ladies to have a conversation. The men will stay and we'll have a conversation. So, any need for any clarification or teasing out of anything? Yeah. So everybody just got mad at you. Just so you know, they're all like. Dang it, why did he raise his hand? I thought we were going to leave early. <laughs> Just kidding. So I asked the question earlier, what are my eyes set on and what's my advice to those who've lost sight of the gospel and been easily distracted to other things, lesser things? Um, well, if you know that, that's good. So I think a lot of people don't know that, though, do they? Um, I, I think what, what, what's important to ask, this is a question I've learned to ask people that I'm discipling, is tell me about Jesus to you right now. Tell me what Jesus means to you right now. Are you, you know, because they might go like, gosh, I haven't even thought about Jesus all, all day long or all week long, you know, like. So first of all, even asking the question, like, what does Jesus mean to you? How are you treasuring Christ recently? What are the characteristics of Christ that, you, that meant a lot to you in the last few days? Um, what about Christ's work are you celebrating in your own life right now? Just asking the questions, I think, is one of my pieces of advice I'd give. Um, second, I, I, would say, I would ask the question, just real directly, what's, what's, got, what's kind of in the rearview mirror of your life right now, and what's in the windshield of your life right now? So what are you looking back to too much, and what are you looking forward to right now? And if, it's not, if the rear me rear isn't the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, and the forward isn't the work of Christ presently and future, then we need to talk. But So just asking, what's got, what's got your view right now? What are you seeing? What, what's imposing in you in your life? And another question I've asked a lot is, what, um, what has become the biggest, the, the biggest E on the eye chart for you right now? Like, what is the E on the eye chart in your life right now? So it's just asking questions like that. And then, then, then of course, we got to help them do all the work that I talk to you about all day, which is, let's look at how Jesus is so much better than what you've been focused on, you know? Your job has become everything to you. Well, how's that How's that working for you is a question I always ask. You know, how's it working with that being everything to you? Well, I'm, I'm stressed and I'm anxious and I'm like, okay, it's not working well. It Jesus is the only one who works really well. So let's talk about how do we repent and turn back to him. So just some of those kinds of questions is what I'd go after. Who feels like a hypocrite? Then your life demands an explanation. So the beauty is if you're a hypocrite, you already have a great opportunity to share the gospel because you just let everybody know Guess what? I'm the king of hypocrites. Um, I say I believe something and I don't, and I'm so thankful I have the gospel because if it weren't for the gospel, I would be hopeless right now. So you start with humility and just acknowledging you're a lousy picture of the gospel. You know, and just like, wow, I'm so glad it's not on me. It's not dependent on me, and I'm so glad he doesn't judge me according to my own good deeds, but according to his. And like, start. I remember I was with a family one time, and they were getting deeply convicted that they should start reaching out to their neighbors who they'd never had a party with, never invited over, and they'd been there for 10 years. And they're like, we now believe we should open our home and be hospitable and welcome them in. But like, how do we start? I mean, this is like 10 years of us not living this way. We've been closed off to them. In fact, we've told our kids they can't even play with their kids. And we've told them we don't want our kids to play with their kids. And I mean, all this stuff. They're like, well, what do we do? And I said, you start with humility. What do you think you should do? We probably should tell them we're sorry. Wow, that's a great start. God's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So they said we threw a, 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 basically a, 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 um, a repentance party, a confession party. And they didn't call it that, but they knew that's what it was. So they, they invited him over, and they said, we want to first of all just say we're so sorry that we've been so close to you all these years. Um, that's just wrong. It was selfish. That was about us. We did that out of fear and selfishness and pride. And would you just please forgive us for that? We, we, want, to, we want to be neighbors who welcome you into our home. That's where they started. Now, now you've got a, a life that demands a gospel explanation, because who does that? Like, now that I'm sure, and I didn't get to hear the final, but I bet you someone said, so what led you to do this finally? It's been 10 years. Hopefully they said, we've just realized that this is what God did with us. He invited us into his house when we rejected him. And, you know, he had every reason to not invite us in, but he invited us in because of Jesus. And so hopefully they shared the gospel through that. I don't know if they did, but I'd say, like, whenever you feel like, gosh, I'm so unworthy, then you're worthy. You know, like, you feel like, gosh, I'm such a mess. How could God ever use me? He, that's the point. 
He likes to use the mess. He likes to take the things that aren't and make them as though they are. He loves to take the broken and work through. I mean, the, the more desperate you are and more messed up you are, the better God looks. You know, I mean, just look at the scriptures. David is not the shining example of faithfulness. You know, but he's a man after God's own heart. How does that work? Is God about killing someone you just slept with, you know, kill, or the husband of the one he just slept with? No. What is, what is the scripture saying? It's saying David understood God's heart enough that he knew God loved a broken and contrite heart. And so David could boast in God and God could boast in David because David got it that he was a mess and he needed God. That's the best place to be. So I just encourage you, start where you're at, exult in your need for grace, be a Gideon, you know, don't be a Saul who thought it was based upon everything he does. It's no, you know, be one who's just humbly saying, gosh, I'm such a mess, how could God use me? And then go and be used. You know, when I hear people go like, I just can't take communion this week, I just feel so unworthy. I'm like, well, you're qualified, take communion. Unless, of course, you don't believe the gospel. Well, of course I believe the gospel, but I screwed up so much, man. I, I sinned so much this week. So do you don't think that you need the, the table? No, I'm unworthy for the table. That's qualification for the table. You know you're unworthy. That's the whole point. Come to the table going, I'm unworthy. I don't deserve this. That's the right posture to go, I'm worthy. I deserve this and go eat in front of everybody else. That's what Paul was talking about. That's the unworthy manner. It's to come as though you deserve the table and you should eat it in front of everybody else. That's self-righteousness and pride. So I just want to affirm like, whether it's you or anybody else just going like, gosh, I'm, I'm just such a hypocrite. Just confess that and then go, God, help this hypocrite to proclaim Jesus. And he, he will, man. He loves using broken people. That's the whole entire story of the Bible. I was going through it with, an, with Ziad earlier. I was telling you about him. We were going through a story. He goes, I don't get it. Every single story in here, these people are all jacked up. You're telling me we're supposed to live our life like this? I said, I never told you that. Who told you that? He goes, well, I thought it was like a moral book. I said, I never told you it was a moral book. This is a story of a bunch of people who are jerks. And God's the hero. Can't you, have you seen that yet? He goes, yeah. God's the only one who gets it right. I said, that's the point of the whole book. <laughs> He's like, really? How come everybody keeps using it like a moral law book? Because they don't get the gospel. I said, the point of this is to show that no human got it right other than Jesus. So are you getting that? He's like, yeah, that's pretty clear. They're all messed up. He's like, what's Abraham doing pimping his wife out? I'm like, I know. <laughs> it's a story. Abraham is a man. He's the father of our faith. He's like, how does that work? Because he believed God. That's it. Not because he did it right. So. so I just encourage you, if you feel that way, man, just boast in your need for Jesus. He loves, he loves, 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 loves to use messed up, broken people. Peter's the best example of it. Can you imagine if Matt Carter gets up over the next three weeks and goes, I don't believe any of this. Jesus, forget it. I don't believe him. I want nothing to do with Jesus. The elders would probably go, get him down now. You know, take the guy off the stage, you know. And they leave him up there and let him go. And then the next week he gets up there and he says it again. And then third week he gets up there and says it again. You're going like, what kind of church are we a part of? What happened? That's Peter three times. And then he preaches the sermon, 3,000 people come to faith. And you're going, Jesus, you use that guy? Why would you use that guy? Because God loves using messed up people who are broken and come back to him and go, please, I love you, Lord. I love you. I love you. Feed my sheep, Peter. I mean, I guarantee you, Peter understood the gospel of grace. Now, he did slip again, as we know in the Galatian, you know, the letter to, to the Galatians. But then Paul got in his face and told him again, this is about grace. Don't forget it. So, just encourage you on that. Yeah. yeah. So the question asked, um, I, I, I'll be honest, I think that, that I'm going to just sit and wait until someone asks me the question. I, I just think that's, that's probably cowardice or a lack of intentionality. Um, so I, I would push against that. All together. I don't see a, I don't see a, ever a command to keep your mouth shut and wait for someone to ask you and uh, don't open it until you ask type of thing. Uh, I would say that we are to be a, such a peculiar people in the world that we should expect that people will ask us. I mean, I think there should be the expectation that we're going to be asked and we should be prepared to give an answer. And I think that's that's First Peter's entire you know imagery of being a sojourner nation in the midst of a, a foreign context, 
and we stand out so radically different that people would ask us. Um, I, I, I think to divorce that from communication, though, is to create a, a probably a, a non-biblical polemic that you wouldn't find in the scriptures. So, um, so I just would say we are go-and-tell people, but we're a go-show-tell people. We're both all three. And I tend to think we've got some people who just go, well, I'm not into showing, I'm just into telling. And so then what we end up having is a group of people who speak a gospel that doesn't saturate their life in such a way that they live differently. And that, that would be my bigger concern. And I think if it seems like some of the, the pendulum swing is like, so now let's not tell anybody, let's just show. And that's the wrong response. The right response is let's show and tell and do both. So I, that's pro probably where I'd land on that. Um, we are a proclamation people. That's what evangelical actually means. It means to be the people who proclaim the good news. So you aren't actually evangelical anymore if you don't proclaim the good news. Unfortunately, evangelical has been too tied up with right-wing Republican, and so now it doesn't mean hardly anything anymore, but that's what it originally meant. So um, to get away from that is, is, a, is a tragedy, I think. Now, I will say on the flip side, I think we've got a lot of people who go, hey, you know what? I stood on a soapbox, I yelled out loud, I said it, I'm guilty of the blood of those people, I move on. And that's just an absolute misreading of Paul in Ephesians, where he tells the Ephesians, I'm now gu not guilty of the blood of these people. He spent two years there, you know, day in and day out, all day long, preaching the gospel, re reasoning with them, to the point at which he could say, everybody in this territory has gotten to hear this gospel. And, 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 and when he said that, I don't think he meant like, I said it and I ran on, you know, and I think there's a lot of people who just go, I yelled it out loud and now I'm not guilty, I move on. And it feels to me like the goal is I don't want to be guilty of their blood instead of I really want them to be saved. And uh, if you want them to be saved, you stay in it, you know. And so I say that because I, we had a, a young man who was doing that approach and I, I stopped, he was going down to our park and standing on a, he, you know, he literally had a box he would stand on and he would do the whole kind of catch them. You know, like, hey, catch them in a lie, or like, see, you're a liar, and there you go. God hates, you know, God's against liars, and you're going to go to hell, and da da da. So you need Jesus, and then you do the whole thing. He's like, see, I proclaimed the gospel. Everybody hated me afterwards. I was persecuted for righteousness. Amen. Let's go. And you're like, dude, like, really? That's what you got from reading the Bible? And, um, and so I remember sitting down with him and saying, let me ask a question before we talk about what you're doing in the park. Do your neighbors know you? He's like, no. I said, you ever had any of them over for, for dinner, lunch, whatever? No. I said, have you ever shared the gospel with any of your neighbors? No. And you think you're being faithful to the scriptures. The scriptures call us first and foremost to be faithful to the household we're in and to be hospitable to the people around us. And if we're not doing that, we, got, we shouldn't go anywhere else. We should start with that first. So you, you're actually going out to do something you're not doing in the place God put you. Let's start with the place he put you. That's your Jerusalem, then your G Judea. Then, you're like, then as you're faithful with those things, let's go out and be faithful with more things. And he told me later, he said, I'll be honest, like doing it out, in the, out on the street was easier than doing it in my neighborhood because I'd have to see them every single day, but I didn't have to see these people ever again. And so it was my way to kind of deal with my sense that I should share the gospel, but I didn't want to do it in this place. And God had really he led him to repentance in that area in terms of his fear of man and other stuff. And he got to a place where he really got set free to do it. And he still does some street preaching, but he does it quite differently. Now he takes the time to get to know them and hear their story and interact with them in some of the ways that I've even talked about today. And then really apply the gospel that's good news to their life. So I, I'm not against the, the street stuff. I just I have a bit of a problem when that's the only aspect of our evangelistic strategy. And I don't think that's the go and tell that we see. Jesus said, go stay in their household. You know, if they take care of you, stay there amongst them. Otherwise, move on. So, um, anyway. Okay, great. And I would just encourage you, for those people who really do have such a heart for a lot of the social justice stuff that's so good and we need to be about it, I'd encourage you to, 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 to like, say, hey, before you start your day off when you're going to go pick up a bunch of stuff after the tornado, pray together that God might get, open a door for the gospel to be preached today. And, and then look for it all day long. And then, it, you know, if, if there's really no door open, I mean, like you tried and, and there's no opportunities, and, then that's one thing. But if you're going like, yeah, I don't, kind of avoiding it, you know, like, no, no, I don't want to talk about it. You know, that's a problem. But God, would you open the door for the gospel he preached? Would you make hearts receptive? Would you go ahead of us? Would you make it very clear? Would you give us words to say? Holy Spirit, would you fill us so we might proclaim boldly everywhere you send us today? That's the prayer they ought to have. 
And then I believe God will do something, you know, in that. He did that in Acts, and I think he still does that. So. You had a, yeah, and then I'll come to, he had a question about the resurrection. Why do I think the, the resurrection is often missed or underemphasized when we talk about the gospel? I think it's because, you know, Paul says, I preach Christ and Christ crucified. And so we go, see, he didn't preach the, it's all Christ, Christ crucified. But then you don't read all of Paul where he says, and he rose again on the third day. I think it's that. I think it's, um, we, have, uh, we have a very strong emphasis on justification. And um, our view of sanctification is not a gospel-centered one. It's a, you now work really hard to be good. And so um, a bit of a truncated gospel I, I think it's because we, uh, and now, I think now I'll make a bigger statement that's more philosophical or worldview-esque. I think it's because we're Gnostics still in a lot of ways, in that we, um, we, we, have a, we have a secular sacred divide in our theology, and so we see th- some things as spiritual and some things not as spiritual. And at the heart of the resurrection, you're saying, no, f- the body is good. And it was resurrected. It's not Jesus trying to get out of the body to a, a, a higher state or existence, which is what the Gnostic Gospel is all about, is we got to get out of this body. Jesus' body was bad. He was trying to get out of it. And so when you focus on the cross, Christ crucified, if, you believe, if you're Gnostic, you're going, yes, bad, kill the body. And that's all you get. But if you're, if you're uh, a biblical Christian, you go, no, the body is what God made to be a, a, a temple. And so it's, not, it's the flesh, not the body, that's bad. And so I think it's some of our Gnosticism slipping into our, our theology. And it slips into the church because you guys will go, like, I mean, I don't know how many times you're like, man, that was an awesome worship experience. And you're referring to, like, something that happened in, with singing or an event. And, like, it's like you went up to the Mount of Transfiguration and then you came back down. And Jesus is trying to show the disciples, I'm the same guy up there as I was down here. It, was, it wasn't one is more spiritual than the other. It's just I let you in to see what was going on all along. I am the, the God who is in flesh. And they just got to see it. And so I think we even betray that we're still somewhat Gnostic and that we look at a church event as more spiritual than our job on Monday, and that we can't worship God just as fully on Monday as we can on Sunday. And so I think it's some of that, too, that slipped in, because the resurrection is all about the Monday, you know, or I should say better, it's all, it was all about the Sunday, the first day of the week, and you know, Saturday was the Sabbath, and the Jews started to lose sight of the fact that Monday through the rest is supposed to be for God, too. Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do all the glory of the Lord. So I think it's some of that, too, that the, the Gnostic gospel robbed us of it, and so we became cross-centered only and not cross in resurrection. So I also think some of our dispensational slants uh, has played into that, and, and so that, and I won't get into, there's so, too long of a conversation to tell you why I believe that, but I, I do believe that we have a, such a small or minimalist view of the Holy Spirit, and I think if you have a really robust view of the Holy Spirit, it will change how you see the resurrection. Or vice versa, if you have a really robust view of the resurrection, it'll change how you see the Holy Spirit. And I think we've, we've put the Holy Spirit out to pasture in the church, so we just talk about Jesus and not the Spirit. But if you start talking about the Spirit, then you have to talk about him raised from the dead by the Spirit that you now have. So I think that's part of it, too. Yeah. Your hand was up over here. And... Okay, so the question was, you used to share the gospel much more as an early Christ, young Christian, and then stopped doing that nearly as much because of the ways it was done poorly at times and how that hurt, and um, now wanting to get back to it, but re- wanting to embrace both the longevity of how long it takes to share with somebody and not give up on them, as well as the, I want to be able to share it in a short term with a person as well. And what I'd, I'll just tell you, if I was in the Bible Belt, or if I was in you know, anywhere in Texas, or you know, if I was here, I would share Jesus in ways that would like totally shock people. That's what I'd do as I, as I, if I was here. So they go like, what? You know, like I'd be, I'd be going like, you know, we're like going someplace and like, man, don't you love how Jesus loves wine? So cool. And they'd be going like, what? Well, I mean, look at his first miracle. He turns 121, 120 gallons of ceremonial cleansing water into the best wine they've ever had. He takes like this sacred thing and he brings it into the party and he makes the party sacred. Wasn't that awesome? And like, someday we're going to get to drink this super amazing wine with Jesus. Isn't that crazy? That's so cool. 
And then they, you know, I'd see what happens. I don't know. Or, you know, like, don't you, don't you love it how Jesus, like, hates just empty religious gatherings and people just singing songs and saying they believe, but their hearts are far from him? Like, he wasn't, and he didn't skirt around the issue about calling our religion, religion out on the carpet. Because he knew that we could know everything about him, but still not know him. What do you think of that? I think there's a lot of people in our churches that know, say they know a lot about Jesus, but really don't. Like, I mean, I'd probably do that kind of stuff. You know, like, I just spur it on a little bit. Um, what we do where we're at, because I'm in a different context than you, um, I play to, the, to, the, to what's going on in the, in the culture that I'm in and just insert Jesus into that a lot. So, like, for me, talking about Jesus isn't a weird thing with any of my unbelieving friends. I do it all the time. It's, it's just no, more normal for me, and that's what I would say to you is, Get into the engagement where it's normal, and it's not like you needed to you needed to preach Christ, you know, born of a virgin, you know, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, lived a per, you know, you don't have to do the whole thing, but you get to talk about Jesus and just make Jesus normative conversation for people, so that eventually they're just used to you always talking about Jesus, and that's how it is with all my unbelieving friends. They're just so used to me doing it. So like I, I was doing an auction for our public school. And they're, they're so anti-Jesus, it's crazy, you know? Like, so I'm up there, and I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the auctioneer, but I'm the MC, and I'm like, and I introduce myself. I said, a lot of you know who I am. I'm Jeff. It's good to be here. I have a couple kids at the school. Um, glad to serve you tonight in this. This is going to be a great party, da-da-da. And, and at one point I said, um, here's the deal. I happen to be a pastor, and I talk very openly about Jesus and how he's the only way to have a right relationship with God. And I want to tell you, Jesus is free. But the night I'm about to have isn't. <laughs> I want you to spend a lot of money. And I want you to bid high. And we're going to make a lot of money to support our kids in the arts. This is not free. But God's grace is. Now, I had a whole bunch of people complain on the evaluation about, you know, like, <laughs> of course I did. And, and someone was in that, in that meeting where they were evaluating. They're like, and they're like, well, what did they expect? It's Jeff. That's my reputation. I'm okay with that. And they said, would you do it again next year? <laughs> they want me to MC again. And that's just who I am. So, like, I don't, I don't think I was trying to offend. I was just being honest about how much, what, what Jesus is like. So I think it's, you know, my wife is known for every party Jesus is coming up. So, and we get invited to parties over and over again with unbelievers. They just know he's coming up somewhere in the party. She always does it. And they're like, yeah, that's Janie. And just so you know, she's not like that person nobody likes. She's the person like everybody likes. She's so winsome and kind and gracious and loving. And, you know, everybody wants her at the party because she's a great person to party with. But she will talk about Jesus at the party. So I'd say start making conversations about Jesus more normative, you know, like, like, Janie is very fond when we'll have a great glass of wine. she go, like, and I, we love doing this with unbelievers. And, you know, I was trying to stir it up a little bit here. But, but like, I'm with, with an unbeliever, and, I'll, and she'll say, man, if there's anybody who appreciates great wine, it's Jesus Christ. And they'll just go, like, what do you mean? And then she'll tell them. And so she does that kind of stuff at parties. Or she'll go, you know, if there's anybody who knows how to make a party great, it's Jesus. Well, how? And then she'll tell them. So it's like, I just would encourage you to make him more normative in the conversation. Does that help? Good. Any others? So how do I take a kind of a cultural Christian who doesn't seem to be changing or that serious about Jesus? In a way, they're almost smarter at it. Like they kind of yeah. Do it yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so how do, are you asking how do I share the gospel with them or how do I help them share the gospel? Anything. Both? Anything. Yeah. So I, 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 think, I think you need to create a healthy fear in the cultural Christian. So, like, I'm real intentional when I'm speaking in the South when I say, they didn't ask him, Paul never asked him, did you pray the prayer or receive Jesus in your heart? He asked him, did you receive the Spirit? That's a very intentional statement. I'm, and I, I, I say that a lot. I especially say it in the South. And then I, and if I'm really, if I'm preaching at a church, I usually say, so if you haven't received the Spirit, you're not regenerate. Which means you don't know God, you just know about God. So I'll say something like that, and they'll be like, whoa, what are you saying, bro? Like, what are you... We're not charismatic here. You're saying, you know, even I already did have someone come to me. I mean, he wasn't a freak out by what I said, but he was, he was saying, did Jesus, you're saying Jesus didn't have the Spirit, you know, until his baptism? I said, no, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he was empowered by the Spirit. And, you know, and so we should know the same Spirit if we're also 
knowing Jesus. So it's something like that I'll say, or, or I'll just, I mean, it's that question I, I said to you, like, tell me, tell me about your affection for Christ. Like, where, where are you growing in love with Jesus lately? And if they're just a cultural Christian, they'd have nothing to say. Because they'd be like, I don't know, man, I read my Bible, I go to church, and I'm like, no, no, I didn't ask about what you do. I'm asking, tell me about how Jesus is making himself known to you, how you're growing in love with him, how your affections are being stirred up for him in your life. So I'll do a lot of those kinds of questions with someone who I sense is just religious, but doesn't really know him. Um, I'll pray with them. I'll say, hey, would you lead us in prayer? Would you pray for me? And, and over time, you'll see that they have a very dead prayer life. It isn't dynamic and, you know, it doesn't feel like they're talking to God. It feels like they're talking about God. You know, like my, my youngest daughter, she, when she prays, she goes, and, and God, we, we just thank you that God is so good and that God provides needs. And, and now she's young, but I'm listening. When it comes to God, I love you, and I'm so thankful that you have done this in our life. And when it gets to be personal versus third person or you know, like second person, like whatever narrative. So I want that first person pronoun. So I'm listening for that. And I might even say, you know, we've been praying for a long time. I've never, like I did with Randy, I've never heard you call God your father. I've, I, have, I've been, I, I, I wonder, do you know his love for you? Have you ever heard him speak to your heart, affirm you as a child? Like I'll ask those di- diagnostic questions with them just to see if, and then the same diagnostic questions you see in 1 John, uh, you see in James, you see in Hebrews, you know, I mean, they're all throughout the scripture, so I'll just use some of those diagnostic questions. How's your love for the body? Are you finding that you just, you want to give more and more to serve and love and care for people and that kind of stuff? You know, are you, how is your growth in understanding grace? Are you just more thankful? How's your thankfulness lately? And, yeah. I might say, does that bother you at all? Does it concern you at all that there's no affection for Christ? Or that you don't, it doesn't seem like you have a close relationship with him? Does that bother you at all? If they go, no, it doesn't really bother me. If that happens, I'm probably going to go, I don't think you're a child of God. Now, I don't know, but I don't think you are. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be straight at that point. Like, if it doesn't bother them whatsoever, go like, it should bother you. Because <laughs> First John tells us you should want to have these things be true of you but you don't care. So I'm real concerned for you. And in fact, I'd encourage you, if you're not really a child of God, stop calling yourself one. You know, like, be honest. And that's okay. I'm not going to stop being your friend. And I'm, it doesn't mean you can't be a part of our church. Just please, like, don't, you don't feel the need to put on a facade. You don't have to do that. God's not impressed with that. He knows you're the real you. He already knows what's going on. So I want to free you up to be you. And I pray that in that, you might discover genuine relationship with him. So it'd be more of that kind of talk. Yeah. I've got a couple guys I'm doing that with right now where it's like, hey, you know, don't try to pretend. I mean, it's, it's painful for you because, I mean, that's living a double life. I don't know how you do it. Like, just be honest about where you're really at. And God's fine with that. He knows. He's not shocked. So. All right, Jeff, so I'll, I'll take the last question. Okay. Yes. So, um, and, and this is, some of this happened to you today. So, a lot of you are unconscious of your incompetence. Incompetence. Okay, so you were like, you came in here like, yeah, I'm doing great. And then all of a sudden you were like, whoa, I don't think I know how to share the gospel into all of life and address every issue with the gospel. And so you're probably unaware of it. But hopefully today you became consciously incompetent. Okay? That's, by the way, that's, that's the learning process. So if you're ever leading a group of people and you want them to go through a change, that's actually some of what I just said to you about the, you know, the discovery about the person's lack of relationship with, with God, the cultural Christian. It's like they aren't aware that they actually aren't regenerate. So that you need to help them become aware that they're not regenerate. That's the best good news they could ever have is to finally be aware of what's true. Okay? So some of you, you went, whoa. I've got so much learning to do. I have so far to go, I didn't realize. And this is, this is like revelation moment, you know, where you're just like, you're aware. And being aware is super good because if you don't become aware of your inability, you'll never ever get serious about getting trained and equipped. So that's good. And part of your job with people is to bring them into a place where they become aware of what they didn't know. And that, in fact, that's even part of your job in, in gospel proclamation 
if all you do is proclaim, but you never help people understand what, that they don't believe or that they believe the wrong thing, or if they never become aware that they're, they were unaware, then you won't have much to give them. So part of your job is to help them become aware that they are incompetent. And then you want them to become consciously competent. And this is the most painful process you'll ever go through. It's like, okay, you guys golfers? Any of you golfers? So like when I, when I started learning, and I, I still haven't had very many, really any lessons, but I have some guys who can give lessons. And, you know, they're walking through posture and, and grip and, you know, your shoulders and back. And, and you're like, gosh, this feels so uncomfortable. And, you know, and, and you're swinging and you go like, well, that actually worked. That was good because before what I did sucked, but this really worked. And so then you keep doing it and you're going, this is really hard. You know, that time of conscious competence is some of the most painful work because you have to keep working hard at it over and over and over again. This is basically the place of practice. This is training. You know, this is gospel reps. And so what you do is you do over and over and over and over again. And it feels like you're not doing it well. You know, and you'll feel this. Like you're going to start to apply this more and more and you're going to go, it feels a little awkward and I, I don't know if I did that that well and the group's kind of not used to this and you know, they push back a little bit. And you'll have a season where you're, you're working hard at growing in this. And you need to do a ton of reps until you get to unconscious competence. So you don't even realize you're doing it. You ever watch like a great athlete and you're like, oh, dude, that guy's unconscious. Well, what do you mean? You're saying he isn't even aware how good he is anymore. Like Michael Jordan was unconscious. Now, I know that I just stated my era because you all think LeBron James is better, but he's not, so, <laughs> at all, okay? Um, but, you know, Johnny Football at times is unconscious, and sometimes... Sometimes he gets himself in trouble while he's being unconscious. <laughs> Sometimes he's unconscious because he got in trouble. But, but either way, you know, so there's, there's this ability, though, that their skill level is so honed in that it, there's like a muscle memory to it, right? And we want to have a muscle memory in gospel fluency so that gospel is our mother tongue. So it's like, it's what we dream, it's what we think, it's, it's how we, we see the world, it's how we measure things, it's how we evaluate things. We're always just going, I wonder what the, the gospel says about this, and that doesn't seem like the gospel, and man, it seems like we drifted from the gospel, and, and it, becomes your, it becomes your mother tongue, and it becomes your unconscious language. And it, some of you have been around me long enough to know that I, I am somewhat unconscious about this. Like, I just do it. Give me a an issue, it comes very fast. And uh, that's not because I've always been that way. It's because I've been working at this for a long time. It's because I keep asking myself, what does the gospel say to this? And I don't let myself off the hook until I come up with a gospel answer to the thing I'm facing. And so I just work and work and work. And even today there was a few where I'm like, well, that's new. That's, that's kind of a new rep for me. I've got to think through that. And, and so it might not have felt as natural as the other ones did because I'm still growing in this. And so I just want to encourage you, the only way you get there is through constant repetition. And what your job is if you're in leadership is you want to create an environment somewhere in here where you keep reveal, bringing people to revelation that they don't know it as well as they thought and then giving them reps so they get to practice it in a safe environment where they can grow in it and develop it more and more. And then when they fail, they can know, wow, I didn't realize I didn't know it that well. So like that whole communion thing I taught, that's a great place to do both of these, where they become aware they don't know the gospel and they get to practice becoming more competent in the gospel. And what will come out of that eventually is you have a people who are so gospel fluent they don't realize they are. And one of the greatest compliments we receive when people come and try to and spend a week with us at Soma School, which is a full immersion into our community, they go live with people who are normal everyday folk that have just been in the, in the culture of gospel fluency for a long time and those people speak gospel language quite well, and they come back going, man, I had no idea normal, everyday people could be this fluent in the gospel. And it's just because they've been in it for a long time. Lots of reps, lots of culture, lots of environment all around them all the time. So, so I encourage you guys, like, this might be really hard. Don't give up. You, know, you might just go like, man, this is like a new muscle group. It is. And yet, it's, it is our language. If we don't get it, this is all we got. So I don't know what you're going to give them if you don't give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to do that. And I'll pray for you. Um, and just pray that it blesses, this day was a blessing to you. And I'll pray that the Spirit lets you 
remember what you need. Father, it is so amazing that you had this plan from the foundation of the world before anything was made that the Son would die for sinners like us and that he'd rise again victoriously and that there would be a human king who is God on the throne of the world we'll enjoy forever. You are brilliant and wise and magnificent. And this gospel is glorious. It displays a gracious God and loving Father and victorious King and Holy Spirit. And we worship you. I pray for these men, Lord, that they would be deeply encouraged in the hope that the gospel is your power for salvation to those of us who believe. And we pray that the gospel would go forth out of our lips and changing our lives in such a way that greater Austin would have good cause to seek out something other than what they've worshipped up until this point. And they would find Christ. And Jesus, we pray you would find them, that you pursue them, that you would rescue them, that you would use these men to speak the truth of the gospel in their life in such a way that they would come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and their whole life would be changed. So would you rescue many, and even us today, would you rescue us? We believe you're still saving us. Save us from our unbelief and set us free for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks a lot.